where did this Ashtanga yoga come from? Because relatively recently, I have to embarrassingly admit, I, I, I realized from articles of Jason Birch, etc., that, that Ashtanga wasn't made up by Patanjali, that there was this mention of, uh, you know, uh, syncretized yoga, you know, with eight limbs or, or five or six limbs be before Patanjali, right? Well, this whole focus on eight limbs, I think, is the thing that we would really need to unpack about the Yoga Sutra. That's not the message of the text. It's not its framework mm, of practice. Mm, it's not It's not mm, really mm. anything other than a way of sort of you know, listing eight, eight aspects of what it is to see through your illusions and remove suffering. And the first half of the second chapter is much more informative for what Patanjali's philosophy is. The second half, which is where you get the first five of those limbs, um, yeah, not so much. Um, and yes, the, the phrase Ashtanga and eight limbs, literally eight parts, um, is used in association with all sorts of different things. In the Mahabharata, mm. there's references to systems of philosophy, systems of medicine. In fact, um, Ashtanga is often you know, associated with you know, medical science, <laughs> the, the eight part yeah. thing that will remove your, 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 you know, your woes, yeah. heal you. I mean, I think, um, I think so Jason I, I think Burke Patanjali's... talks about it in the yeah. Ayurvedic term, in a, exactly, uh, yes. the famous yeah, yeah, Ayurvedic yeah. text. can't remember the name of it now. Charaka um, Samhita. Yes, that's the one. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> yeah. so there's, this, there's this constant emphasis on a similar framework. Um, and, you know, it comes perhaps you know, from the same place that the Buddha got his idea. It's not to say that it's all ripped off from Buddhism, but you know, there's an earlier history of people stepping out of society, going to the forest, trying to understand this problem of suffering. Um, and they've all come from this shared body of knowledge, uh, which was outside of the mainstream of the Vedic ritual. Um, which has then come back into Vedic religion, is also there in Buddhist religion, it's there in the Jain religion, it spreads elsewhere. It's now become this sort of free-floating yoga discipline that anybody anywhere in the world can practice, which is just about understanding the nature of suffering and how to remove it. Um, and the Buddha's description of that was, you know, we, we have this tendency to see to suffer. We suffer because we want stuff. We don't always get what we want. The problem, therefore, is desire. Um, and this desire can be eradicated by an eight-fold path. <laughs> and so, the, the notion of removing suffering in eightfold paths are very closely connected. So Patanjali obviously felt that you know, to show his system work, having an eight-part summary of it would be quite handy. Um, <laughs> so but there aren't really eight parts make it... to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, his, his basic method is this one is point the populace, of focus. wasn't he? Yeah, yeah he's easy well, yeah, yeah. to summarize there, but he says that the tool that will liberate you is to just focus your mind till it gets so well, subtle I... that you can see the difference between your mind and consciousness. Then you I, will be know, he, he knew, I think it's because he knew that no one really fancied that. He knew, like, that's, you know, no <laughs> one's going to take that. So I give him the Ashtanga, you know, they'll get, you know, it's like, it's a, like a, they'll get involved in the Yamas, you know, and speculative about whether they're doing right or, you know, and they'll enjoy that. I'll give him that. But all, know, of and, those, and be, all of those preconditions you know, are just, you know, the Yamas and the Yamas, they're, 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 they're tools like, that will make it easier to sit still. That's all they are. I think the thing is, why, I mean, you know, the Ashtanga yoga, I mean, as I say, I think we're going to almost draw it to close because I want to come back to this with you again in, a, in the next one. But I mean, the, the Ashtanga Yoga really is now talked in the same breath as, and you know, and start and finish the Yoga Sutras, really. The like, you know, Sutras of Patanjali is the Ashtanga Yoga, learn the limbs, and there you've got it. It's really, that's a small part of it, this category. And and the, small, the smallest part of it, you know, potentially is really talking about this, uh, the, the Yamas, you know, and, and yet, you know, to to my frustration, I mean, this is the main discussion of the text is about these yamas, you know. Um, whereas, I mean, really, I mean, potentially, um, you know, I mean, he was talking to the converted. I mean, he was talking to renunciated yes. lay people. I mean, you know, like, I think it was just you know, like flying through the yamas, really, because it would uh, one would assume that they would already be doing the yamas, right? Mm -hmm. This, you know, as you say that, really, I mean, he's talking about one pointed focus and. Yeah, destruction of the of the mind as we know it. You know, he's not really talking about how to how to live a a good life in 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 society because they're they're not living in society. Exactly. Yeah, and um, there's even a question as to whether this was ever used as a teaching text or whether, as I say, it's this kind of you know, encyclopedia entry that summarizes what yogis get up to. It's not even clear that Patanjali himself was a yogi. I mean, he certainly hadn't reached Kaivalya because he's still sitting there talking in the world and writing a text. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, there's this, this also, I think, this other question that we have to engage with. The reason that we're so obsessed in the modern yoga world with eight limbs is that one of them is asana. Um, so it provides this ancient justification for the idea that do your you know, regular postural practice uh, will somehow have you on the road to liberation. 
I mean, it can perhaps, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with being liberated. It can get you much more entangled in suffering very easily. It can get you much more ego invested, much more fixated on results, all sorts of things. So um, potentially it's talking about an analysis of why we suffer. And you can you know, combine that with postural practice 100%. But then you need to read the first half of the second chapter that talks about why we suffer, not the second half that lists eight things that aren't really separately eight things anyway, and certainly have nothing to do with making shapes, because Patanjali's asana um, is clarified in the commentary as sitting still. Yeah, I mean, and I can't res um... I can't resist to wrap it up with a like, let's <laughs> let's uh, let, you know another little kind of like a very embarrassingly quick to uh, sequester through through the concepts of yoga. I mean, so Patanjali's yoga is basically as a as a precursor for meditation, right? As a seat, as a seat or a a, a foundation for stilling the mind, right? That's the use of asana right a steady and a comfortable position for meditation is that is that yes, correct although, although it's not yeah. really even i mean potentially yoga is stilling the mind that's all there is there is no there is no you know, a, cal yeah. calisthenic stretching there's none of it right. there's none of it at <laughs> really? all. Right, okay. that's what the has what the happy ah. yoga text in no text talks about anything other than sitting or beating your body up by you know, holding the arm above the head for the rest of your life until about a thousand years ago a thousand years ago you start to get non-seated postures the earliest being maya rasana Okay. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's it's completely different concept, and it just has nothing to do with modern postural yoga in that sense. It does have yeah. you know, a lot to do with trying not to suffer, but you know, it's a different story. Yeah, I certainly want to get to get more involved with this uh, concept with you later. But I mean, where do we first find the, the term yoga um, used as a methodology? Then I think I, th I believe the Vedas do talk about it, but I think they talk about it in as a, a form of sorcery or something like that. Uh, you know, a kind of well, mind yeah, control. So it, the um, earliest Vedic use of yoga um, is, is a, a synonym for war. Um, yoga oh, really? does mean joining things together, connecting them is one of its meanings. The other meaning is concentration, which is what it means in most early texts like Patanjali's. Um, in the Vedas, it means joining your chariot to an animal to go into battle. Um, so there are hymns that ask the gods for you know, favor in war. And the word used there is in yoga. Um, so you know, we want your blessings for our yoga of hitching up the wagons to go out. Right. Okay. So territory. that's where David Gordon White gets that kind of idea of rigging. You, you heard that? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly right. Okay. Right. Right. So the the earliest text the dots. Earlier, right. So, so the, right. The okay. yeah. That's the first place where we hear about yoga as a you know, term associated with inward focus, yeah. stilling the mind in the senses, um, disengaging yeah. from the outside world. And it's not until you know, the medieval era that we start to hear about you know, perhaps cultivating the body. And, being in the world, perhaps even being liberated in the body. Instead, before that, it's right. about leaving the world behind. And nobody today really. So, if we could draw a broad, a broad, broad strokes again, can we say first and foremost, yoga is used as an ascetic practice of withdrawal um, when it's yes, referred to, yes. um, you know, um, you know, withdrawal to transcend. And latterly, in the medieval age, we start to find creeping in from one place or another this idea that we can, might use yoga alchemically more, more, you know, not exactly in the fashion we're currently doing, but well, maybe I'm sure some people believe they are, um, you know, but, you know, the idea that you Just can... Just have a read of the and we'll see that we're not really... God, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, but yeah, you, you're gonna have a, the idea that you're using the body for, for some energetic transformation, right? But, but, yeah. So, I mean, would those be correct as two, two rough rough streams to draw through the, the Exactly, the yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I think I think really... Physical yoga practice, as we know it today, is a relatively recent invention. We have to acknowledge that there aren't sequences of postures taught to groups in classes, uh, people who live in the world, <laughs> uh, until the early 20th century is the earliest evidence we have of that. But going back a thousand years before that, there are, as you say, you know, physical techniques, moving energy, um, transforming the body, not trying to destroy the body or leave it behind. Um, and then all of the 1500 years plus before that are about leaving the world behind. So those are the sort of three broad phases. There's modern yoga, then there's medieval yoga, and then there's ancient yoga. Um, and they've all got slightly different objectives. Originally, it was, you know, get get out, get off the wheel of suffering. Anything will yeah. do. This is such a serious problem. Basically, give up on life. And Patanjali is a summary of all of that. The medieval Hatha yoga texts are a summary of the next phase, which is, as you say, body is an alchemical crucible. It can bring about stillness. It can bring about, you know, um, clarity of vision removing these illusions um, through harnessing you know this capacity to do um, so that doing is no longer an enemy 
but in the modern era, yeah. it's about you know being embodied and enjoying it, <laughs> enjoying life in the world. Um, and that's rather, completely like, different. <laughs> it's a rather different cake, isn't it? It's like kind of baking. Yeah. It's like you've baked these kind of cakes and they're kind of similar, and then it's like the icing is just like completely different like you know your modern posture yoga being this kind of like oh we've kind of got these cakes and it's like you know it's like a you know, peanut butter and chocolate and now it's like we're gonna put on like you know like raw avocado icing or something just like completely like well, it's a relatively reasonable and I metaphor think the reason, using yeah, the, the raw avocado, avocado. Is, but um, <laughs> and the, um the point though is to emphasize it's got, like, it's a little it's smear at the top which is just kind of <laughs> But that doesn't make random. it bad, I mean, Adam. You know, we, 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 no, we, absolutely. You, you and that's, and I, mean, I do want to kind of... We come to, we come to physical no, no, no. To we're kind of making, making fun of it, but it's... it's yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and I do but want to go back to that it's later. it's got a uh, different you, philosophical but, framework, um, and that's what we really need to yes, acknowledge. Yes, it's attempts, yes, exactly. attempts to try and um, rationalise what we do today through the prism of Patanjali just end up misleading us. <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah, yes, And that's what we're talking about meditation. Yeah. Yes, the thing is, there's nothing wrong with what we're doing. And, you know, when you, I know, from your great uh, great little uh, articles on your your study with the yengar which i find very amusing <laughs> uh, on your website if you read them they're yeah, funny yeah. um and you know me for many years have done this yoga and i believe in it you know and enjoyed it and got a lot out of it but it isn't the same thing and i think you know it's worth like anything knowing your roots and, and it makes it more interesting and it makes one also reflect upon one's own aims you know and mm. and then That's methods, the key. That's methods it. within exactly. those aims you know mm. so once you've got an aim then you might also amend your method slightly or qualify uh, your attitude towards something you know with a maybe a potentially rounder and broader view of your objective um let's you just summed finish it up up, really right? well there adam just, just to Thank finish you. what i'd like to say yeah. this is, is, is one yeah. kind of contribution that builds on that is that you know, yeah. the connecting yeah. thread therefore is inquiry um, if we're asking honest searching questions <laughs> that is consistent with the earliest Upanishads. that's that's what they were mm. doing um, so n- not believing our own stories you know oh y- yoga comes from the vedas and it's all been the same for thousands of years etc cetera, etc cetera. but to actually ask ourselves take responsibility for our own practice why do i do what i do what am i trying to achieve with it and then answer, uh, answering that with a vague inclination to look back into the past and see are there any other threads like you know internalization of awareness uh, you know, working with the breath all these things that do have you know, a thread going back into the past and again that's why i wrote my book to try and yeah, illustrate how lots of these building blocks are ancient but the, the thing that's been made out of them today is a brand new construction so we're all going to make our own construction but you know, it helps to see what you know, in that might still at the same time take us back in, in, in time without pretending that it's all in the yoga sutra mm. I suppose it's seeing the contradictions and, and seeing the possible difficulties and discrepancies in it is, in the end, traditional yoga. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know right? <laughs> right. Um, Differentiation. Well, yeah, 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 discerning, give, discerning one thing from another. That's give really give or two a, a, few, a few dodgy methods over the centuries um, and our current more <laughs> sanitised <laughs> approaches, perhaps. You know, I mean, many of the approaches we've discussed, and especially with Jim on my interview with him and Jim, James Mallison, uh, you might not do in the current yoga class. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, a bit more private. Um, <laughs> I'll leave it there. But, um, I mean, just, um, you know, to finish, um, uh, Daniel, what about this term Hatha yoga then? I mean, you know, um, James uh, actually also described it well, and I think you, you maybe use his term as well in this idea of something which uh, when we talk about hatha we're talking about something because it, it involves many again many many different possibilities and techniques and you know um you know h- how do we find a thread through it you know what what is it that denotes something as hatha apart from the the, the vaguely gentle and uh, and more uh, uh relaxing auntie of uh you know of vinyasa or ashtanga Right in, in the current well, yoga, in the modern world, yoga that's scene the parlance, yeah. well, of course it's hatha yoga. <laughs> you know, it's fine. It's not dangerous, and you won't injure yourself. But I mean, in tradition, <laughs> that doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that, that, <laughs> mean that at all. The literal meaning, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, means, it means force and violence. So it's, yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah, almost yeah. the opposite. But these texts that teach it, um, you know, from about uh, ooh, 900 years or so ago onwards, um, they emphasise that they're trying to do something forceful with the body. Um, trying to have powerful effects through, you know, heating up, you know, basically uh, energies through particularly breath control, um, so as to blow your own mind. <laughs> so you're heating up the alchemical crucible of, of the torso by locking it at the top and the bottom, um, turning the breaths around on each other until they explode upwards. Um, so it's using the body to still the mind. So it's, it's basically a, a broad catch-all term for forms of yoga practice 
is like a compound. You achieve the state of yoga through this forceful engagement with the body by making it do things that aren't natural to it. So sealing it, holding the breath, turning things around, moving things upwards. Um, and that's that's the sort of basic you know, framework within which it all operates. But obviously over time, there are texts that teach all sorts of techniques that contribute to that. And you know, increasingly complex and uh, you know, different, different contortions um, that uh, we recognize today in advanced asana practice you know, come into the picture. But they were never mm. the sole tool. They're the preparation for working with subtle energy in the body. That's Hatha Yoga. It's just manipulation of particularly the breath, but also um, sexual essences, um, mm. energetic uh, representations of deities. That's where the chakra system comes in. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but all, all, of, all of that is under this broad heading of you know, using the body to go beyond the body. Um, so it's still going beyond the body, but it's, you know, the body is a tool. We need to cultivate it. We don't need to destroy it. <laughs> we need to, need to look after it so that it can help. So in the end, you do actually have to practice these forceful techniques carefully um there's a phrase shanai shanai that crops up in, in texts, mm. which basically means mm. step by step little by little carefully gradually um, so effectively gentle yoga is actually the essence of the pata um, despite the fact that it does mean forceful <laughs> and also i mean you use the term in your book as well i, I would kind of really like it the idea of stubbornness or um you know as james madison jim says uh bloody mindedness you know it's a very exactly. English yeah, yeah, use yeah, of the yeah. english bloody term. doing something yeah doing something, something in kind of stubbornness is is uh yeah. is happening and i kind of like that idea in terms of practice like when you don't feel like it when you kind of you know you're in bed and you just think oh, i lie and that's another hour or get up and have a coffee and a croissant you just think no no i'm gonna you know it's like, that says you know, that, that, that kind of resonates, right, in terms of what we're doing currently. There's a certain stubbornness about it. No, I don't want to do it. Of course, you know, get up every day and think, oh, asana, yes, please. Uh, you know, but, you know, you do something, you know, and it's almost just the stubbornness of doing that thing that you kind of don't necessarily want to do, you know, for a higher purpose or, or, or for your highest purpose that I think unites, you know, us to that, to that earlier, to the earliest iterations of, of this thing well, no, you know? i mean this is evolving today and you know, i've seen you talking about this in, in recent months um that a lot of these ancient you know, systems of discipline that we were told about that didn't really go back much further than 100 years anyway um you know aren't necessarily all that helpful they can be quite rigid they can be quite dogmatic um and yeah. perhaps subjecting oneself to it day in day out isn't ultimately right. helpful after 20 years <laughs> perhaps a little bit of variety is good and perhaps a little bit of softness and, understanding this delicate balance between you know what potentially again he's got some useful tools in his yoga sutra you know, categorizing as the balance of um vairagya detachment letting go with apyasa making an effort um so you know, putting put, putting some you know stubbornness into it while at the same time still remaining subtle enough to know when you know we're pushing too hard and not just you know, whipping ourselves over the back in the desperate hope it's going to save us from something but instead really recognizing actually today is the day to stay in bed and to have two croissants <laughs> well you've qualified you've taken my point now that's a good point to turn around my my, my general tone on, on myself um but um so i'll end it there um but um it's been a fantastic little uh, run through, and I hope you'll join me again, Daniel, for for another one. Um, oh, um, we haven't really yeah. even yeah. got into uh, two ideas <laughs> of Sam, Samkhya, which I wanted to. The next part is a, a little uh, little one hundred and one through through ideas of Samkhya yoga and what that means, and the gunas I was planning with you, and maybe yeah, even yeah, you know, maybe even a little bit of Bhagavad Gita. So um, I hope hope that listeners will uh, will stay tuned and enjoy another episode when uh, when Daniel agrees to come back with me again. So uh, thanks again, yeah, Daniel. If you great. haven't got the book, yeah, get the book. The Truth of Yoga as you see is very very clearly explains things in a much uh more simple uh or the simplest terms you possibly can given the subject which is contradictory paradoxical and a bloody mess really <laughs> so thank you so much daniel for coming well you're welcome and thank you very much for inviting me and if, if i may just just uh, invite people to check out my website truthofyoga.com there are some courses on there that go into much more depth on each of these texts if you want to dive deeper yeah, we'll put that in the uh, notes. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you again. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> thank easy. you.